my introduction to Brother Ernest happened some time back, just prior to the turn of the century. And uh, we were living at Soon Arrows at the time. And Brother uh, Ernest was uh, at that time just across the uh, border in I Falls, International Falls, uh, as a uh, pastoring a, a, a small congregation there, Christian Life Chapel. And uh, it was during those years that uh, we got together numerous times and I learned to develop a, a real appreciation for this brother, a man that uh, was passionate for the Lord, who uh, loved the Lord and uh, was uh, really called uh, me to a higher walk. Uh, times of prayer and fasting that we shared together in accountability. And uh, it was during those years that uh, he and his family had uh, uh, felt a call from God to enter the uh, mission field in LA and I remember him telling me years ago that his prayer I believe I have it correct is there 19 districts in LA 88 Sorry, I'm <laughs> but I just remember him saying I'm praying that that God will will have an, an Anabaptist influence in every district of LA I don't know if that's still your prayer or not but uh, so when we were sitting together, uh, of course it was during that time after they moved to LA that uh, there was the tragic loss of his wife in a uh, car accident. Um, and so that was a, a, his, a lot of his story in the last uh, uh, years, 10 years. And um, as we were sitting together as a committee, uh, going through and developing this, uh, this uh, program, and uh, we were thinking of this first topic, the essential or the pastoral role in confession. One of the essential elements, I believe, in working with these uh, kinds of situations is trust. Because trust has been broken in so many ways. And uh, of course, trust is developed through integrity. And so when I, as we uh, were talking about who would be individuals, to uh, talk on this uh, subject, I mentioned Brother Ernest. Uh, I looked to him as a man of integrity, a man who loves the Lord, who's a family man. I looked at him as a shepherd uh, of, a, uh, of uh, many uh, people. So I am just pleased to, now, uh, to introduce him today and to have a word of prayer with him. Uh, I just will mention real quickly that he did bring along a couple books. Uh, one of uh, the books that birthed out of his journey uh, with the loss of Rachel, his uh, spouse, uh, The Way of a Bride with Her Groom is over here, written by Ernest, and then his son. I don't know how many of you have read any of the blogs by uh, Asher Whitmer, that would be his son, and uh, he now has written a book, Live Free, and the subtitle is Making Sense of Male Sexuality. Both books have a suggested donation price of uh, $15. If you take both, there would be 25 One of the things he wanted to make clear is that he's not here to sell the books. He would rather make sure that you get it in your hands, and uh, if uh, you so choose uh, just to take them without a donation, that is completely okay. But that is the suggested uh, donation price. <coughs> Can I pray with you? Sure. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We thank you and we praise you for your kindness, your goodness. Lord, as we um, give our time and attention to Brother Ernest, may you anoint him with the power of your spirit, and may our hearts be open to receive what you have for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Bless you, Lord. Good to be here with you all. Anabaptist Disciples of Christ. I, uh, in so many ways, feel unworthy to try to share along these lines. I, I have so much to learn and so much a, a work in progress myself. <clears throat> but uh, by God's grace, we'll share what he is given us good to have some choice books people here uh, I have often said choice books was the vehicle that got us to Los Angeles and in many ways what keeps us there um, good to have you here Dave and uh, 
Mrs. Dave. I should I should remember your name, but I'll call you Mrs. Dave. Okay, so am I still live or can you hear me okay? Okay, good. That it's not quite so echoey. Yeah, well, uh, I was asked to share um, about the pastor's role in confession, and I need to move along here fairly rapidly. I think I ended up with more material than we're going to be able to cover in 45 minutes. Uh, this is Los Angeles. If you were to fly in, you would, at night, you would see something of this. I always like to show this picture, and if you can imagine, behind every one of those lights is a soul, uh, probably several maybe several hundred souls and uh, so when you're feeling adventurous come see us in Los Angeles there's a darkness in Los Angeles as there is in Ohio I think and pretty much all over the world and I don't know if you got the news L last night there was a shooting in State College uh, by a man named Jordan Whitmer. I think he spells his name the same way I do. And uh, so there's darkness in Ohio, there's darkness in the Whitmer family. And uh, that's why we need the light of Jesus. I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are ripe, ready for harvest. I'd like to note a few what I call notable brothers. Uh, and if you, s sometimes I think we as Mennonites are a little too modest and that we hardly ever want to say anything good about somebody unless they get arrogant or proud or something. I, I use this scripture here. It says, Mark the perfect man and behold the upright for the end of that man is peace. So James, you just heard here, he's one of the notable brothers I'd like to mention. As he's already said, we have a relationship that goes back many years. And I uh, just remember many heartfelt conversations uh, with you and Gladys and Rachel and I. Thank you. Thank you for being who you are. And it was such a blessing to me to hear after you had left the North and how you settled into whatever the name of your church is, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, I just have sensed God's hand of blessing on you. Brother Bill, I'm going to be talking after a bit about how we as pastors need to be fathers. And uh, in an interesting sort of way, Bill has been a bit of a father to me. I always struggled to, to have a sense of the father heart. of God, to feel the Father heart of God. I was okay with Jesus, but I wasn't sure about the Father. And um, God has used Brother Bill in our ministry there. And uh, I remember driving along in my choice book truck one day and just reflecting on, uh, sorry, <clears throat> some of the negative things of life, some of the hard things, losing Rachel, and then uh, Kind of a, along with that, reflecting on some of the amazing goodness of God. And, and one of those, it was just as I was driving along, it, it came to my mind, and, and I, I sensed an image of the Father heart of God. And it had Bill's face. And the sense I had was that I was leaning my head on God's chest. It was Bill's chest. Gave me a whole new 
experience with the Lord that I had longed for for many years. And it was just because here's a brother that <coughs> was willing to be a father. Now, he's probably not old enough to be my father, but Close. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that God has used to help me become aware of the Father Heart of God is just within the last number of years, it just occurred to me. You know, Ernest, you know how much you, you know the huge heart that you have for your kids. He said, that's my heart for you. And I was kind of like, duh, why didn't I think of that before? You know, and I just love my kids. I would die for my kids. That's what he did for me. So I share that with you. God has a huge father heart. And um, we as pastors need to uh, reflect that. And then there's Mark. He's the perfect man. I'm a little older than he is, although I probably respect him more than he does me. <laughs> Years ago when Rachel and I were Maranatha Bible School as Dean of Men and Women, uh, Mark was there as a student, fine young man, and uh, it was my role to make sure that the guys got to sleep every night. and. So after lights were out, I was tiptoeing through the dorm, and Rachel had made me a cup of tea, and I was carrying this cup of tea. It was the moonlight was shining in through the window, so I had some light. And suddenly I heard some whispering off in the corner. And I went over, and here was Mark whispering with a friend of his. And not, not in a disruptive sort of way, just I don't even know what they were saying, but it just occurred to me that I should go over and offer them some tea. So I went over and stepped up and oh, suddenly there's the dean and, they, and, I, and I just said, would you like a sip of tea? And so they each dutifully took a sip of tea. <laughs> And then I said something about, us, you know, probably better go to sleep here soon or something like that. And the next morning at breakfast, Mark came to me and he said, what did you have in that tea? I said, I just went right to sleep. <laughs> uh, many of you are notable brothers. And I, one of the reasons I was looking forward to being here this weekend was to meet many of you. Last summer at our BMA Ministers in Richmond, no, it, it was the summer convention last summer, at the business session, our uh, moderator, I think that's what we call him, um, was sharing a story of a, one of our pastors who had failed morally somehow. And his credentials were being uh, taken. And and I just remember there were, what, 50, 60 pastors in the room there. And, and as he shared that story, you could have heard a pin drop. And it's because every single one of us knew that that could be us. And it occurred to me there, and I talked with the moderator afterward. <clears throat> In fact, I, I think he opened it up for any questions, and, and, and I just spoke up and I said, you know, if we're going to use Jesus' definition of adultery, I think I'm guilty too. Because he said if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. 
I don't know too many men that could say they've never been guilty of that. And so by, by Jesus' definition, and I said, you know, it's too bad that we can't turn something like this into almost like a revival. Because if we'd start looking at the heart issues and we'd say, I'm guilty, I failed in this area, the level of the heart, maybe we wouldn't be having these things work their way out in our lives. Jesus sets the standard. I think there's a danger of idolizing marriage, and we're not going to spend a lot of time here, so don't worry if, if this isn't quite what you were expecting, but, you know, it seems like for everything else in life we say, Jesus is the answer. But when it comes to our sexual issues, then so suddenly it's like, ah, marriage is the answer. And we know, I, I'm, I'm a believer in marriage. I love, I love being married for 28 years and 17 days. <coughs> but I think, well, we'll, if we have time, we'll talk about that more later. But um, I don't know if any of you have read Bridget Eileen's blog, Meditations of a Traveling Nun. Have, have any of you read her at all? And I hope this doesn't spur a debate or some kind of a problem here. She identifies as a celibate lesbian. She is a fundamental Baptist, I believe. But that would be her testimony. And she says, sexual fulfillment does not come through a sexual relationship but instead through sublimation to Christ. Jesus really is the answer. I know we've done some singing, but would you mind singing this song with me? I love this song, especially when I think of pastors and confession. Are you familiar with the song, We Place You in the Highest Place? Let's just sing this song together. We place you on the highest place For you are the great high priest We place you high above all else All else And we come to you and worship at your feet. Now, you know, in a real sense, we don't place him in the highest place because he's already there. I can't put him there. I can't take him away. But this song really speaks to the highest place of my heart. That he's in the highest place of my heart. How about this little song? Are you familiar with this? I say yes, yes, yes. I say yes, yes, yes. I say yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord. I say yes, yes, yes. Kind of like that other song that we know. Let's sing this one again. I say yes, yes, yes. I say yes, yes, yes. I say yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord. I say yes, yes, yes. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but someone that I think knows more about Hebrew than I 
said that this, the verse there in Psalms where it says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. If it were translated more literally, it would be, the fool hath said in his heart, no God. Now more recently, a Wycliffe Bible translator said that's not quite accurate, that it actually does give the impression of his existence. But I still like the picture. The fool hath said no to God. It's a wise person that says yes to God. And that's what confession is. It's agreeing with God about two things, about who he is, about who I am. So, are you willing to be an example in confession? If you are here this afternoon and you know that at some point in time you have lusted in your heart or maybe you have experienced something else that you would need to say, make conf- acknowledge and simply say, yes, that's who I am, that's what I've done. Then agree with me and let's sing this one more time. I say yes, yes, yes. I say yes, yes, yes. I say yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord. I say yes, yes, yes. Pastoral care and restoration. First of all, approachableness, able to be approached. I think that's fairly obvious. Someone who folks can feel safe around, uh, not intimidated by. I love what Bill said about uh, not being a policeman. It involves disclosure, which is the opposite of closing. It's opening, disclosure. Recently I sat with a counselor just talking about some of my journey and and some of what I was going (coughs) through and and I was talking about some in relation to some of my kids and and uh, and he said, you know, you, you need to you need to give disclosure to your kids. You need to let them know what you're, what you're experiencing. That's what disclosure is. Being open. It's the opposite of... You know, we as men especially, you know, women will do that. They'll sit around tea and they'll just bare their hearts. Dr. Marlon Howe says that um, women are body modest but soul naked. Now, our culture would tell us that women are body naked. That's not really who they are. They're only that way because men want them that way. But we as men are body naked, but soul modest. If we're asked to bear our souls, we just... Disclosure. We need to be that way as pastors. Confidentiality, not to be mistaken for secrecy. There's nothing about our role as pastors that wants to promote secrecy, where we have secrets. But we will be confidential. So, there you are, ADC. Now I think I can sit down, right? First Corinthians 4, 15 says, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. The church needs fathers. Let's uh, open your Bibles. I think I have my Bible here somewhere to uh, this passage, 
I was going to read the whole thing, but I don't think we'll take the time to read the whole chapter. I think we'll jump in here at 1 Corinthians 4, verse, verse 10, I think, maybe. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. How many times would you as a pastor just kind of like to reverse that? And say, we're wise, you're a fool. I'm strong, you're weak. I'm honorable, you're despised. But Paul is taking the very opposite. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled we bless, being persecuted we suffer it, being defamed we entreat, we are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. I write, write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. We need, we need church fathers. We need fathers in the church. As pastors, we need to be fathers. As pastors, key to, to fathering is, uh, and pastoring is modeling, being able to model. I remember there was a situation in International Falls where we lived probably about 12 to 15 years ago. And there's a long story here, but I'll just because of man's unfaithfulness to his wife, he not only he had an affair with his wife's sister, so his wife was not only betrayed by her husband, but by her sister. Kicked him out of the house. Not part of our church, but part of our church community, another neighboring church. And I remember one time him, him simply saying to me, so, so for a while he lived with us. And he said, he said, Ernest, I saw you over there just kind of visiting and interacting with your kids. How, how do you do that? And he had two small kids at the time. And it, it made me aware, and I share that simply to say, we need to model I have not always been a good model, but sometimes I have been okay. We need a model. We need to live out the way we want folks to be, and the whole thing of confession. We need to model uh, behavior, obviously. Less obvious is the fact that we need to model these heart dynamics, the heart values, uh, relationships. Somebody's already mentioned that, relationships. So much is transferred in the context of relationship. And we'll hurry along here. I'm being told we have 20 minutes. We need to model confession. We need to model reporting. If the law has been broken, we need to report to the authorities, okay? It should never be the role of victims to have to report should go without saying. If we have broken the law, we need to report ourselves. It'd be interesting to hear what Mark has to say about some of these things. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working that you may be healed. We sung that song, I am the Lord that healeth you. We are all on a journey of healing. All of us have been healed. We are being healed. We have yet to be healed. So we're, we're, we're in it with them. We're not somehow above it all. We have yet to be healed as pastors. Five elements to salvation. One is faith. Second, confession. Repentance, that's our part to salvation. That's the roles, the responsibility we have. 
regeneration, that's God's part, or born again is, is where we get that expression. And then baptism is the church's part in salvation. Church plays a very critical role in salvation, in baptism. But we're going to look at confession. It means to same say, to say the same thing. When God says, I am Lord, we say, yes, Lord, you are Lord. When he says, you are a sinner, I say, yes, Lord, I am a sinner. That's why I love the little song. I say, yes, yes. God, you say you're Lord, I say yes. You say I'm a sinner, I say yes. Agreement, to same say, to say the same thing as. Confession is not about shaming. It's about agreement. Agreement with God and agreement about ourselves. It's agreement with God. Uh, uh, yeah, Agreement with God about who He is and what He can do for us. And agreement with ourselves about who we are and what we have done to Him to others and even to ourselves. So it's, it's alignment, agreement, confession, openness. Say the same thing. But God does not shame us. He redeems us and delivers us from our sinfulness. It ought to have been alluded to as well. He, he's not punitive now. He will someday punish but today he's not punitive. He, is, he disciplines. He corrects. But he's not punitive. He redeems. It's not about shaming us. Confession for sinners is to themselves about who they are and to God about their desperate need for him. When confession to others facilitates the protection of victims, then that confession should be as public as is necessary to provide the protection needed. It may be the protection of those already victimized, so they're not re-victimized, or it may be the protection of potential victims. And to that extent, we need to be public. We need to be... There's no point in shaming somebody just for the sake of shaming them. That's not the purpose. It's for protection. Though they're, and also the protection of the sinner himself. The repentant sinner's prayer is the Lord's prayer. Deliver me from temptation. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. It's for my protection. Back to Jesus' standard. We are Anabaptists here, right? Anabaptist disciples of Christ. Did you... Did you... Get my attention if I'm approaching 10 minutes here. As Anabaptists, we don't have a flat theology. We don't have a flat Bible. Our, our theology has an apex, and that is Jesus Christ. It's solo Christos. Everything points forward and back. He's the center of it all. Amen. That's who real Anabaptists are. Now we've many times gone afield from that. That doesn't mean that nothing else matters. But He is the center of it all. Jesus Christ is the apex. Everything flows to and from Him. <clears throat> so let's allow Him to define adultery back to that point I was making earlier happens in the heart. That's where real adultery happens. You have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if your right eye offend you, pluck it out, cast it from you. It's probably that one of your members should perish, not that the whole body should be cast into hell. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, cast it from thee. Again, the same thing. That whosoever shall put away his wife, you have heard, saving for the kind of cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Much we could say there, but we need to hurry. Again, 
Um, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, shall no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You've heard, thou shalt not kill, but I say unto you, um, whosoever shall shall be in danger of the judgment, but I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Back to the heart. It's the heart. So preemptive confession protects us all from our own sinfulness when we recognize our own um, propensity to sin. When we agree with Jesus about our heart's propensity, whether it's adultery, murder, or pride, uh, which really is the root of it all, that keeps sin from working itself out in our lifestyle, if we are real about it happening here in our hearts, this is where we should be having confession. This is where we should be. We shouldn't be having confession after I've had an affair with my neighbor's wife. I need to be having confession when I'm lusting in my heart. I'm struggling with that. Confession, again, is agreement. It's alignment. When we align ourselves with God, His resources of grace flow freely into our hearts. Too often we take sin seriously only when it's expressed outwardly. So we're concerned about those who commit adultery, those who murder, those who abuse others. Okay? And obviously, rightfully so. I mean, Jordan Whitmer kills Dean Beachy and his son David. Steve. Steve. You know, yeah, obviously we're concerned about that. But we ignore the sin of lust and of anger and of power, the desire for power and control only when the action occurs. That's not how Jesus looks at it. He looks on the heart. Where are we? Oh, we still got two minutes? Twelve minutes, okay. Well, we might have some time here. Didn't have to go so f- fast after all. Uh, you know, let's. Is it okay to have some discussion? Sure. Okay. Um, and then we want to conclude with this song again. So, what? Maybe you have some questions, some concerns, maybe some corrections. Brother. Thinking about the, uh, the lust issue and, and that, what could precede that to prevent that? Is there any way to prevent it? Is it something that's gotten off track when we get there, but can we identify how we, what happens when we get off track? So is, is there something that can prevent the lusting? So you're saying even ahead of the lusting. Good question. Just make sure all the women dress modestly, right? That for sure isn't going to happen in today's world. Mm -mm. That don't fix the problem either. No. It's, It's like people that say, you made me angry. No. We get angry because we have unresolved probably pain here. We have to be real about the same way with and if you if you perchance if I can give a little uh, promo for my son's book here, Live Free it's, it's a beautiful presentation of the gospel the gospel of Christ it's, it's not this whole thing of overcoming lust It's within here. Sex is not the issue. We're just filling a big hole in our hearts. And Jesus wants to fill that hole. And that's what the gospel is all about. He talks about fig leaves, using fig leaves. Adam and Eve used 
you know, we need the garments of God, the righteousness, the presence of God in our lives. Maybe you have a further thought on that. How do we? What's the preemptive? I think your comments are, are right on. They're, all of us are made to experience fulfillment. But when we're missing that fulfillment in our relationship with God, we, uh, in someone else's terms, we self-medicate. We, that's why people use drugs. Right. And all kinds of abuses. Right. So I think honesty, I think what you're alluding to is honesty. And that's where, conf- that's where this whole preemptive thing, let's be real about this. This is what we're facing. We, there's no sense in pretending like I could never shoot somebody like Jordan Whitmer did. I mean, but by the grace of God, that's me. I could never commit adultery. But by the grace of God, that's me. Let's be real about that. Let's be honest about it. Let's talk about it. It's okay to talk about what we're struggling with in the, in the right context. Any other questions? Corrections? Could you enlarge a little more on your opening thoughts? Do I feel a sense the father heart of God? Do I feel... Do I, do I feel the... F- enlarge a little more on, on I guess... Okay. Yeah. From your own Let me just share something that happened to me just in the last maybe two months. I was either just waking up or going to sleep. I think I was waking up and I was just, I felt this, fa- I'd been feeling this famine, just this deadness, this numbness, this lack of love for God. And as I was waking up, I was just, I don't know if I'd been dreaming about it or what, but I was actually weeping. It was just like, God, why, why don't I love you? I just feel dead. And it was like he whispered in my ear and he said, don't worry so much about loving me. Just think about how much I love you. And there was something about that that just clicked for me again. It was just like, okay. Because we love him because he first loved us. So when, when we will really get a focus and a, a feel for His love for us, suddenly we come alive to Him. Now, that was my experience. Someone else, how would you answer that question? One more minute. We have one minute. You have a further thought on it. Amen. Let's stand together, sing this song. I say yes, yes, yes. I say yes, yes, yes. I say yes, Lord. I say yes.